Good afternoon. My name is Alicia Mosley Austin. I am. I am assistant dean of the graduate school and associate director of the interdisciplinary neuroscience program here at the University of Rhode Island, and I'm one of the planning committee members for Inclusive SciComm. And I want to welcome you to our, our keynote speaker presentation this afternoon. Um, I'm very excited that I get the honor of introducing Dr. Rachel Burks who is a analytical chemist and forensic scientist. She is currently a assistant professor at State Edinburgh University in Austin, Texas, where she does research on novel detection devices for various compounds and how do we use these detection devices in a portable um, way to for various different applications. Um, and she has a very um, inclusive and hands-on and engaging methods of teaching at her institution and involving undergraduates in her research. Um, you may also know Dr. Burks as Dr. Rubidium on Twitter, um, where she has a very extensive following where she talks about science and pop culture um, and inspires all of us to think about different ways to engage the public um, with different areas of science. Um, she also helps you create and organize Psy Pop Talks, which is a popular talk series um, for science and pop culture. She created DIY Science Zone, which is a hands-on experimental um, space for um, various science conferences, such as Girl Geek Con. Um, and she is also um, produces content for American Chemical Society, both video and um, blogs. And she's done lots of different types of science communication across different venues and for different audiences. And we're very excited to have her here to talk about voice and value. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rachelle Burks. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Thank you for that kind introduction, which I'm going to get a recording of and put in my promotion and tenure package. Uh, so I haven't always wanted to be a scientist. Um, so when I was a really nerdy kid, does anyone remember the show Family Ties? Yeah. I was Alex P. Keaton. Um, I had a little briefcase that I went to the library on Saturdays. My dad used to take me, and I would, I would read the law books and write essays on collateral estoppel, which my dad would read. Uh, but I wanted to be a scientist much later, and I came in that, came to be a scientist uh, through forensic science. Um, so maybe not a complete left turn from maybe law. Uh, but definitely... I think one of the bigger problems why I didn't want to be a scientist is because when I saw scientists, this is what a scientist looked like, right? White man working alone, right? staring into brightly colored solutions, right? especially if you're going to be a chemist. I think that's like actually a requirement for the job is you have to stare at brightly colored solutions, which is good because I do stare at brightly colored solutions because that's me. But that's about where the similarities end. Right? So we're told, at least I was, when I was coming up and being a scientist and being a science communicator, that you needed to do serious work. And you needed to talk about it in a serious way. And you had to talk to the, quote, right people. I'm not any of that. Right? And I did that for a long time. And anyone who's done code switching for most of their life can tell you how damn tired they are. And I just got to the point where I was tired. Right? And it didn't satisfy me. I didn't feel like I was speaking in my authentic voice about things that I was interested in. And I didn't feel like I was talking to the communities of which I was a member of about the things that we all cared about. So what was I doing it for? It was one of these questions that you have to ask yourself, not just about science, but about science communication. I didn't want to just talk about chemical research that was published in the highest impact journals. They have people for that. I wasn't interested in doing that. You know what I wanted to talk about? Zombies. <laughs> because chemistry is going to save our lives in the zombie apocalypse. And that's what I wanted to talk about, is I wanted to talk about chemistry of zombies. I wanted to talk about why biotechnology will keep you from being the walking dead. These are the concepts that I wanted to talk about. And I wanted to talk about it 
in the way I would talk about it to my friends and to my family. Right? I wanted to use the, the voice of which I didn't have to disguise. Right? So I did. And I wrote a blog called Chemistry for the Zombie Apocalypse. And I made a video on that, on the death cologne and how it would save us all, on chemical camouflage, and biotechnology to manufacture it. Because if you're going to need it for a pandemic, you have to be prepared for that, as we've seen with our antibiotic problem. Right? We cannot wait until we're in the middle of a zombie apocalypse to kind of find out a solution. We've, watched, we've all seen Walking Dead. That doesn't work out for them either. Right? So it was a good vehicle, and it was my 15 minutes of fame for sure. Right? It actually got a mention on Saturday Night Live. Right? And that also is in my PNT portfolio. Uh, <laughs> So that bit of success, right, emboldened me. And I got a little scotch. I said, OK, that's some validation that that voice and the things that I'm interested in and what I want to talk about, maybe other people want to talk about them. So that emboldened me to go full 100% nerd, OK? Because I am a nerd, right? I'm from a, a mixed culture household. And by that, I mean Star Wars and Star Trek. <laughs> They can live harmoniously together. Okay? And I want to be able to really get into the literature and the debates of our time with my fellow Whovians. Right? These are the topics that I wanted to talk about. Okay? I want to talk about Game of Thrones. I want to talk about The Walking Dead. But the way, of course, because I'm also a chemist and a science dork, I want to get into why wildfire works so well as a weapon, chemically speaking. Right? Like, those are the topics that I want to talk about. Right? And so I went full nerd, and that's what I did. Okay. So yes, I have given talks on Alien versus Predator. Clearly, Alien should have won, and that movie was nonsense. You can debate me later. Uh, <laughs> but talking about those ideas of what's the chemistry and the ecology and, and, and what's the animal behavior, I've been on great panels about that. So I wanted to talk about those types of topics. But of course, one of my favorite fandoms is Game of Thrones, right, the show. There's so much good chemistry in those books. Most of it is trying to kill you, but let's, you know, I am a forensic scientist, so that's kind of my jam. Uh, so talk about that. And this is the part of the SciPop talks that I organize and have made videos for. And, of course, I got to talk about Star Wars uh, for ACS Reactions, which was one of the highlights. Yeah, yeah, PhD, whatever. Star Wars. Okay. That was really where it's at. Um, and then I get to talk to folks at genre cons like Comic-Con and Geek Girl Con. These are some of my favorite conferences of the year. So, of course, I go to American Chemical Society. I go twice a year. I've been to AAAS. These are some of my favorite conferences. And which conference do you think I hear the toughest questions? American Chemical Society. Dragon Con. <laughs> Dragon Con, by far some of the best, most thoughtful, in-depth questions, right? Because how many people have been in a technical session, you're speaking, right? You get up there, and there's actually no questions about your work, right? Or the question is really more of a statement with an inflection on the end, <laughs> right? But if you're in a room with other fans, you are going to get, you know, you better know your stuff, number one, right? You're, sometimes we worry about that with technical meetings. You don't need to worry about that with technical meetings. You need to worry about it when you put some theory forward about why the Death Star can't work. That's when you need to really know your stuff, right? So I love those meetings. And you get to talk about all kinds of science, right? And you get to also, what I love, is you get to talk about the scientific process and scientists, which is just as important as the research, right? So how many people have watched a science fiction movie and seen a science character and thought to yourself, the hell are they doing? <laughs> you don't do that, right? My favorite, of course, is I feel like anthropology always gets the shaft because they're always opening up a sarcophagus. OK, that part's kind of true because there was that news story that came out, right? And some curses unleash, or they do something wacky, right? So that's also what we get to talk about is not only the science, but the profession, right? And, and how we engage in science with the world. Okay? So I love going to these meetings for that. I've also got great opportunities to be on television, so I'm on a show called Outrageous Acts of Science. 
uh, which is on the Science Channel. It's basically, you know, sometimes people do crazy stuff, and then they record it and upload it to YouTube. There's a bunch of scientists then to explain why they didn't die. Okay. And so that is a great show, and it kind of fits into what I like to talk about on why this thing works and why it doesn't. So I've had the opportunity to do that. And then I got to write a column for Chemistry Road. So I get to do my thing and talk about, quote, non-serious topics, right, silly stuff. Uh, and all of that led to me being offered my own column in the Chemistry Road magazine, which is the official magazine of, get ready for it, the Royal Society of Chemistry. <laughs> right. That's very fancy. Uh, so, you know, I, I got to do my own thing and, and some have some measure of success. So I hit my stride. I do a lot of different SciComm. Some of these are kind of one-way engagement, right? And some of these are more dialogues. You're really talking to people and engaging with people and hearing what they have to say. Okay? So why did I hit my stride? Well, there's actually some great work on this, as we've talked about already this morning. There's some great literature on it. And part of it is, what I love about the pop culture tie-in is that there's some great studies out there that talk about using these types of fandoms and ways to connect with folks. And part of it in the teaching community is, is a couple quotes here. This is from the examination of teacher authenticity in the college classroom. So authentic teaching is perceived when teachers are viewed as approachable, passionate, attentive, capable, and knowledgeable. Okay. And I am definitely passionate about poisons and murder on Game of Thrones, right? So that's good, and zombies, of course. Right? Teachers are perceived as authentic and capable when they are acting out of genuine concern, respect, and care for the students. So as a member of various fandoms, I am absolutely engaged with those communities and I care about the members of my communities, right? So I am gonna treat them with respect and everybody's voice has value. Right? So how many people have read the entire uh, series of Song of Ice and Fire? Right? So that is a tremendous body of literature, right? and I don't know it all. So when I'm in a room with fans and I can contribute my chemistry, they can contribute just as important and just the amount of knowing the character backgrounds and why a certain decision maybe didn't make sense because don't you remember the third paragraph in chapter 17 of Storm of Thorns, right? Like Storm of Swords. And I'm like, no, but please refresh my memory, right? <laughs> so everybody has something to contribute, right? And, and because I'm a part of these communities and because if you're a member of the community, you tend to treat it, treat it with respect and care, then your message is what people want to hear because you're people, you're part of the group, and you're listening to them and you're engaged with them. But also, there's a really great line here that I think is really important. Teachers should enact such behaviors only as far as their personality and demeanor naturally allow. So, in the, what does this mean? This is like a lot of mumbo jumbo. In the words of my people, you do you. Okay. Who are you naturally? What is your conversation style? What are the things that you're interested in? I am a class clown. I've been a class clown for a very long time. I'm sure there's at least two or three third to fourth grade teachers that will tell you how annoying that is. Okay. And that is just my personality. I'm a jokester. Right? I, even though I'm serious about my job, because I'm a forensic scientist, it doesn't mean I don't like to have fun and crack jokes and talk about, quote, silly topics. That is who I authentically am. So it makes sense then that if I am actually who I authentically am, I started to see success. Right? And the good news, because that's what sometimes people value in positions of power, is that the research backs this up. small problem, right, is that, you know, okay, so problem solved. I just act who I want to be and, you know, keep it real. And so anyone that watched David Chappelle's show knows what's the next part of that. When keeping it real goes, okay. Now, what is the wrong part then? <laughs> 
the question should be, what, what do you mean by wrong? Because right? so far, nothing has gone wrong. Right? I've been asked to do things. I get to speak to cool groups. I get, like, everybody here. Right? So what is the thing that could go wrong? People could not like it. People could not like it. Okay? Which people? Because if I'm being asked to do stuff and I'm on television and ballrooms are packed to hear me on a panel, which people? Huh? The, yeah, the tenure committee, right? That, that's a completely different audience. So perhaps the people that I'm really worried about when we say when keeping it real can go wrong are not maybe our people. They're the establishment in all caps. Okay? And who are they then? I think that's part of the thing we're talking about in this meeting. Who is they? And, and why do they have this influence? I think we all know that because we're here at something called inclusive science communication. But then I have to deal with that. I can't just, keeping it real has, has brought me some great invitations and opportunities, but then there still is this problem. Right? And that is a real problem. It's not going to you know, go away by just thinking, OK, well, if I'm successful, then I don't have to worry about it. Right? Because we all know it's not quite true, right? is that you can be doing tons of service and bringing tons of acclaim and getting tons of offers, and you might still not get tenure, a promotion. That work may not be valued by who again? maybe people in perceived positions of authority, power, and influence. Okay. That is a legitimate concern. So then the question becomes, what do you do about it? Right. And so part of what I did about it to deal with this problem is I got some great advice. When I was giving a talk back at my alma mater, University of Nebraska, go Big Red, okay. I have to say that, or my degree gets revoked. Uh, <laughs> is that you know, you're doing all this great stuff, and you should be recognized. But what, what are the ways of which, what, what, is, what does academia recognize as being valuable? No, no, not, not what they say they value. What is actually valued? Publications, grants, okay? and research in the way that brings in grants and pubs. Okay? So the advice I got was, and I call it the Chris Rock School of Academia. Whatever you do, get paid to do it. And that payment may come in a lot of ways, but if academia recognizes grants and they recognize papers, then what should you be doing? Okay. That does not mean, however, that you can't do what you want to do. The advice I got actually was, all of this that you just talked about, researchize it. Pair up with someone, do a nice little survey, self-efficacy data, talk about your audience, slap in the term data-driven, write up a paper, get it out the door. Okay. Because you have a valuable skill, and I did not know this, right? so I'm passing this on. Being able to do the kind of work I do, run the activities I run, and have them be successful is a thing that many scientists can't do or they don't know where to start. They don't know what assessments to do. So how do we share that information if it was literally any other area of our career? You would write it up with an intro, a methods, a discussion section, and you would what? Push it out the door. That is the advice I got. I'd never thought about that before because I didn't know it had that kind of value. It took a mentor saying, this absolutely has value, especially now, because if you definitely are sitting there going, of course it has value, two words should come to your mind. Broader impact. Okay. And if you, are, if you know what those terms mean, right, in grants, you've got to talk about broader impact. But it's just not good enough to be like, we're going to go visit some schools and like, do some stuff with some kids. Right? What do they want now? You've got to have good assessment. Data-driven, okay. thoughtful in your research question. Okay. 
And that's what I started to do. Right? My work had value to me, but I needed to communicate that it also had value to the people that were going to be assessing it. Right? It's what I call a two-for-one. Don't we love two-for-one? Right? I got to still do things in my voice the way that I wanted to do them. I researchized it, and I got to also count it right for P and T. Right? So I do science communication research. It is part of my research portfolio. And last year I published on, by the way, I got the word fandom in an American Chemical Society journal. <laughs> Almost the proudest moment is when I got the F word in nature. But, yeah, yeah that was pretty good, too. Uh, but that was back when I was a grad student. So, But I got that in, right? So the work always had value to me, but I also needed to communicate that it had value in the system that I was in while also trying to change that system. Okay? That is the currency that they understand. And sometimes you have to speak the language that your audience understands. Okay. So here's my paper, okay. Journal of Chemical Education, first author. Thank you very much. Right. Now, leave me alone. No. <laughs> That's what you, and I did just say that out loud. That's what you want to say. Right. But now that is an area, I've researched it. So now it is my area of scholarship. So some things I'm doing, again, I love them, they're fun, they might be service, but I've also turned, because it is, it's something that is data-driven, it's something that people do as a profession, it's something that they study. It is an area of scholarship, it does have academic value, it has societal value. Right? And so knowing that now, that also changed my attitude. So that was one thing with value, that I had to, I had to fix that. And I had a great mentor, again, that really helped tell me that. Right. So that then, I had value in those circles and with those folks. Right. So that enabled me and emboldened me even more. But there was still another problem. <laughs> okay. If you're saying to yourself right now, like, she looks like she's so with it and like calm and comfortable <laughs> speaking in front of people. Okay. Sunshine will tell you, that is a lie. Okay. That is a lie. I go through this thing where in the week before, I am freaking out. I feel sick to my stomach and nauseous. It's not an easy thing for me. Okay. I'm always nervous. I'm not going to say the right thing. Um, people aren't going to laugh at my jokes. Um, and because I'm a class clown, that's what like really gets me. Right. But I do it anyway. Right. I know I'm never going to fit in. I gave up on that, remember, way back in my existential crisis of what that picture of a scientist is going to look like, right? And when people talk about all oh, the great science communicators, we need, you know, another Bill Nye, we need another Carl Sagan, we need another, no. I'm never going to be that, and I don't want to be that. Right? I know that, and I'm comfortable with it. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. Okay. But I need to have more confidence in my methods. I need to have more confidence in my voice. And I needed to have more confidence in my value. Okay. Because if you've grown up in a system that does not value you, and then one day you're supposed to walk up and act like I'm totally confident, how do people do that? That doesn't happen overnight. And the fact that anybody thinks it should tells you the problem. Okay. So it's not easy, but I've gotten to the point where I'm just doing it anyway. Because okay. this is what you're supposed to do. You know, there's a prayer I sometimes put on Twitter. Lord, grant me the confidence of an aggressively mediocre white man. <laughs> I'm not there yet, but I'm getting close. I'm getting better than that, because I, I don't want to be that. That's not who I am. I'm unapologetically black. 
Let me say it again for the cheap seats in the back. I'm just kidding. You guys are great. <laughs> I am unapologetically black. I'm going to talk the way I talk. I'm going to look the way I look. I'm going to do my hair the way I do my hair. Okay. That is the community I'm in. That is my first priority. It is my last priority. Alpha and Omega, amen. Okay. So I don't need this. I need that. Right. I want some swag. Right. I want Beyonce level. I am who I am. This is the message I have. You either get on board or you GTFO. Okay. You need, I want that level. I want Beyonce. Right? I want that, ooh, that gravitas. Okay. Now, how do you get there? Besides being a great singer, dancer, and playing the piano and being Beyonce. But anyway, anyway. Well, this is what I, I keep coming back to. General Leia, also known as Carrie Fisher. Is this quote, I have it in my office, I always share it with my students, stay afraid but do it anyway. The confidence will come. If you wait for the fear to subside, you won't get anything done. If I had waited till I felt better, I wouldn't have gotten anything done. Until I felt smarter, I definitely wouldn't have gotten anything done. So at some point, you have to be comfortable with the fear and keep moving. And, and it doesn't have to be, again, you don't have to explain that fear to anyone else. It doesn't have to be rational. And maybe somebody else won't understand what you're afraid of. This is about you. You can be afraid, stay afraid. Those feelings are valid. I'm not here to tell you, oh, you shouldn't. No. You can be afraid. Keep moving. Do it anyway. And what if you don't feel like doing it anyway? Also, the words of my people. You need to fake it till you make it. That was one of the big things my dad said. I know you don't feel like you can do it right now, but you're going to need to do it anyway. And if you don't feel confident, fake it. And then once you have a success, what happens? Brick by brick, you start feeling better about it. You start feeling more confident. Again, I'm not quite at the aggressively mediocre, but I'm getting there. I'm, I'm, not, I'm definitely not at Beyonce levels, but I'm, I'm aiming to be in that direction. So you can definitely get there. This is one of my favorites. I'm not going to ask this. You know it. If you suffer from imposter syndrome, mine is relapse and remitting. Okay. It will never go away. I've accepted that. Okay. But I can also say, not today, Satan. Right? Is that today I'm going to do, or not even sometimes the full day. Maybe you're like, for the next five minutes, I totally know what I'm doing. And that is good enough. Okay. And this is important because if, again, if the fear is keeping you from finding your voice and your value, you're going to need to do it anyway. Okay. That's the hard part. You got to do it anyway. And there's a reason why you need to do it anyway. You are absolutely 100% needed. Your voice is needed. We need to know about your work and your experiences. And if nobody's ever told you that before, you have something of value to add. And more importantly, if you are an underrepresented minority, then we absolutely need you more than ever before. Your voice absolutely has value. Your experiences have value. And your insight has value. I want to hear from you. And I bet you the person next to you wants to hear from you. So you can stay afraid, but you have to do it anyway because we need you. Because, you again, you have value. And I've said that a lot, but why do you think I keep saying it? Because maybe you grew up not hearing it enough. 
but your community and their opinions, your opinions have value. In science, this is an emotional topic because we're people, people do science. Okay. If you think that science is purely objective, then you wouldn't be here. So I know I'm speaking to the right audience. Okay. You have value and your voice has value and we need to hear it. Okay. Think about where we are right now. I know some of us really don't want to. It's been a tough week. Okay. Actually, it's how, how tough has it been for how long? Feels like forever. Okay. But this is the time we need to build each other up and say that I need to hear from you because we need you and you have value and your communities matter and we need to hear from you. Again, science, you know why I love it? Because it has the opportunity to uplift, to bring us out of the darkness, to make us powerful in many ways. And the danger is it also can subjugate. As we've seen, time and time and time again. And as we're seeing now, there's a resurgence of scientific racism. Where people are trying to beat back the advances that have been made and trying to get away from ideas of sex and gender. That's another reason why we need to have as many voices in the room as possible. We want to be on the right side of history. When the arc of justice finally bends, we want to be where? That means that we need to have the right voices in the room. And the right voices in the room are not the white voices in the room. I see a lot of beautiful faces here. They're, the voice that we need to hear is yours. So that's going to require a little bit of courage. Okay. You got to stay afraid, but you have to have enough to keep moving. Have you ever been afraid but still ran? Have you ever been afraid and literally been like immobile? Okay. Be afraid, but keep moving. And if you're an ally, so you're not in one of the, the URM groups, what should you be doing? You get out of people's way, or you drag them along, or you push them. Right? You lift them up. Right? That's your job. Everybody has value, but everybody might have a different role, and that's okay. You want to think about, as I know lots of people have, is who needs to be speaking right now and what do we need to be speaking about? Who needs to be heard and how should it be said? Okay. And that might change week by week, day by day. In this country right now, it feels like second by second. But those voices need to be heard. So Dr. Cooper, who's on Twitter, she's Professor Crunk, is now is the time for the public scholar, right? She writes about that a lot. And, and black women public scholars have been living in real kind of bold action for a long time, right? And the consequences, as we've seen, of speaking out can be severe, right? So what can we do, though? We have a big room. There's a lot of people in this room. The people that take bold action need to be backed up by people who take maybe a different bold action, the bold action of support. And then if you're in a group this size and you're all kind of, yep, we're afraid, but we're going to do it anyway, can you imagine if everybody in this room had that attitude? What that would look like? I feel like there, there must be a little bit of that here because you're literally all here at something called inclusive science communication. You've self-selected to be here because you think, guess what? You already think that your voice has value. And more importantly, you think that everybody's voice has value and that we need to raise up the voices that aren't usually heard because you're already here. The call is coming from inside the house. 
And that's good, right? So what would be my advice besides be afraid but keep going forward? It's still that from Carrie Fisher. Also one of the great philosophers of our time. Keep it cracking, keep it pushing, keep working. Again, you're already doing that because you're here. Right? You're trying to listen to new things and learn new approaches and learn about the latest research and engagement and outreach, informal science education. Right? And also learning, how can I do my job better? Right? And I'm a member of a lot of different communities that I would call myself a black intersectional feminist. But I got, I'm not a member of every community. And I, too, need to take a seat and listen to underrepresented voices of which I am not a member. I have a lot of work to do. And how best to engage. Right? And how best to assess. So we're always hustling. Right? But again, I know you know that. Because guess what? You're already here. You're already, some of you are, you've been doing science communication for a long time, but you still came, right, and you're still participating in sessions because you want to keep it fresh. You, you know that the, the data always changes, right? We know this as scientists, as practitioners. Okay? Situations change, community changes, right, and we need to be able to evolve and adapt, right? So thinking about why you're here, many of you are here is because I want to serve my community. And if your community changes, guess what you got to do? Change with it. Right? So you're, you're doing that. You're staying engaged. I mean, think about your scientific fields. There are advancements all the time. What do you do? You don't stay in the back. There was this great photo that was tweeted. It was a hand centrifuge. Does anyone remember doing hand centrifugation? Okay. I remember the dark days when people used to pipette by mouth. <laughs> what? Okay. We don't do that anymore. Well, you sh uh, let me say this. If you are still doing that, <laughs> stop it. Okay. We have new stuff, right? We have new tools. We have new methods. So we need to do this, right? We keep it fresh. Well, the same thing comes to when we learn about communication, right? When we learn about engagement and how better to serve our communities and to serve the big community, too, of science, is that we can do that in better ways, right? And we do that because just like in our science fields, we need to keep it current. We need to keep it fresh, or you will be left behind. You don't want to be left behind, because we're moving, right? Even though we're afraid, we've all agreed, and by, I just made that bold proclamation that we've all agreed, right? that we're going to move it forward. Because right? I want you to remember something. I'm going to close with this. You have a voice, and that voice has value. And I'm going to say it again, just in case, because remember, I'm a teacher, so if I say it once, it's important. If I say it twice, it's going to be on the exam. <laughs> okay. You have a voice, and your voice has value, and we need it. Okay. So I hope that you believe me when I tell you that I want to hear from you. And even if it's just me, okay, you should say it whatever it is, right? and the audience will come, right? especially if you are your authentic self. It will happen, because one, we know that, right? It's not just you. For every one of you, who are you really probably speaking for? Probably a lot of other people, right? You're voicing community frustration or joy or action or something like that. And that voice matters. So whether you find it now or it takes you years to do, right, it will have value. Right? And again, I want to hear from you. So wherever you're at, whether it's big or small, right, say it, say it out loud. Because right? you have a voice and you have value.
Thank you.